If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them to the book of Zechariah. We're going to be in Zechariah chapter 3 this morning. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 this morning. So Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove his filthy garments from him. And again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, if you will perform my service, Then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. The book of Zechariah is one of the post-exilic prophets. He's one of the minor prophets. The minor prophets are sometimes called the Twelve because it's the last twelve books of our Old Testament. And of those twelve, Zechariah is the longest. His name, Zechariah, means the Lord remembers. Many of the prophets in the Old Testament point forward to Christ. At the top of that list is probably Isaiah, but underneath Isaiah, coming in number two, is the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah, like his contemporary, Haggai, was commissioned for a very unique purpose in redemption history. In 538 B.C., King Cyrus of Persia freed the captive Jews to return to their homeland and begin rebuilding the temple. And about 50,000 Jews returned from Babylon and began immediately doing this work. Well, it didn't take long before opposition began to turn against the Jews. And it dismayed the people, causing them to stop the work that had been given to them. And after about 16 years, the Lord commissioned Zechariah and Haggai to stir up the hearts of the people to finish this work that they had begun. The Jewish people were at a very unique time in their history. They had been in captivity for a long time, and now they're being released to return back to their homeland and build the ruins of their country. It was an exciting time, but it didn't take long for that excitement to wane. They were beginning to rebuild and resettle, but there was still a long ways for them to go. And so the Lord commissioned Zechariah sort of to encourage the people to get them to continue moving the ball down the field, if you will. They needed to move forward. The people had a problem, and the problem was that they lacked leadership. And they lacked leadership on two fronts. They lacked leadership in the civil realm, but they also lacked leadership in the spiritual realm. And that's why you see in the, in the prophet of Zechariah and Haggai, these two people rise to the, the center stage of the scene, if you will, and that is Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel was the one who was to be charged with the civil leadership aspect of the nation of Israel, but Joshua was charged with the spiritual leadership of the people. And so what we have in the passage before us this morning is the Lord commissioning, really reappointing, if you will, Joshua to his ministry as high priest over these returned exiles. 
But just like the rebuilding of the temple in the civil realm, there was opposition. Opposition from Satan, and really opposition also from Zechariah or from Joshua's own sin and the sins of God's people. As you look through this passage, I think you see several parallels between Joshua and Christ. But the more I've studied this passage, the more I've seen not just parallels between Joshua and Christ, but Joshua and the believer. And so what I want to do this morning as we go, we'll look at those parallels between Joshua and Christ, but I want to spend the focus of our time on the parallels between Joshua and the believer. And really there are three parallels that I want to look at as we work our way through this text. There's parallels between Joshua and the believer in his confrontation, and that's verses 1 and 2. There's parallels between Joshua and the believer in his cleansing, verses 3 through 5. And then there's parallels between Joshua and the believer in his commissioning, that's verses 6 and 7. And so it's my prayer as we work our way through this passage that we would all be encouraged to greater confidence in what Christ is now doing on our behalf, that we would have a greater assurance that our iniquities have been removed from us, and that we'd have a greater zeal to serve the Lord more faithfully. So as we work through this passage, we'll begin with number one, the parallels between Joshua and the believer, particularly in his confrontation. It says in verse one, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, as you read through the book of Zechariah, there's eight visions that the Lord gives to Zechariah. When you get to chapter 3, this is the fourth of those eight. And we're brought into a heavenly courtroom, as we often are in Scripture, and we're introduced to Joshua. Joshua was to be the first high priest over the remnant that had returned from Babylonian captivity. He was the one that was charged with reestablishing the worship of of God's people after the temple was to be rebuilt. And here he is standing before the Lord. But he's not alone. You see there in verse 1, Satan is also standing at his right hand. Now, this is not the first time we've seen Satan in this position, is it? If you remember back to the book of Job, the very opening verses of Job, when all the sons of God are gathering themselves before the Lord, Satan himself also comes in their midst. It seems from that passage, between his roaming around on the earth, he apparently uh, makes his appearance every once in a while in the courtroom before the throne of God along with the other angels. And why is he here? We see at the end of verse 1, he's there to accuse him. And that's not surprising, is it? We're told in Revelation 12.10, he accuses the brethren before God day and night. In fact, accusing and opposing God's people is such a part of his character that his name literally means the adversary. And it's interesting to note in this passage, the word Satan and the, the word accused, those are actually the same Hebrew word. One is a noun And one is a verb. So you could literally retranslate this phrase. Satan was standing at his right hand to Satanize him. You see, Satan is always the one behind the scenes, instigating these things against God's people, trying to dissuade and destroy God's people. He's the one who's trying to make this remnant lose courage and stop rebuilding. Sure, you have Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem and all these other guys and leaders who are trying to dissuade the people, but ultimately it's Satan behind the scenes instigating all these things against God's people. And I wonder if you realize this morning, you're in verse 1. Do you realize that Satan is standing at your right hand to accuse you? He's not just the accuser of Joshua. He's the accuser of the brethren. Jesus said he's a thief, and he comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. He's a liar and the father of lies. He's a murderer, and he's been a murderer from the beginning. 
He is the one who instigated the fall of the entire human race. And even some of the angelic host, he's real. And he opposes you and he opposes me. And this would be bad. We're not the right man on our side. Because the good news is, as Satan is standing at your right hand to accuse you, one even greater is at the right hand of the Father to defend you. Amen. 1 John 2, 1 says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And that word advocate describes literally the opposite of the accuser. He's there to come alongside you and to plead your case before the judge as the accusations are coming in. Satan may be there accusing you, but the Lord Jesus Christ is equally there to defend you. While Satan is ever before the throne trying to condemn your life, Paul declares in Romans 8, 33-34, ultimately no one can bring a charge against God's elect. Christ Jesus is the one who died. God is the one who justifies who can condemn Christ died, yes, rather, Paul says, who was raised and is at the right hand, interceding for us. And this is the ministry he entered into when he ascended into heaven, and he carries on that ministry to this very moment. Hebrews 9 says he didn't enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 7 says he's able to save forever those who draw near. Why? Because he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, as Satan is coming before the Lord, I don't know what he's expecting. You know, for all I know, as I'm studying this passage and I'm thinking through it, maybe he thinks he's going to be given another opportunity like he was given in Job's situation. He's going to be given the opportunity to tempt and destroy the life of Joshua. But you know, Satan is ultimately on God's leash. As Martin Luther said, the devil is God's devil. And when the devil starts to go too far, the Lord is there ready to yank on that, that leash. And so as he's here trying to condemn Joshua, and by condemning Joshua, really condemn all of God's people, the response he gets is a rebuke. And not just one rebuke, but two rebukes. You see, he says there in verse 2, The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Do you see God's election in this verse? The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem. You see, Satan's goal is for God to forsake his people. But the reality is he will never forsake his people because he's chosen them. This word chosen is used many times in Scripture to describe God's electing love that he places upon his people. And it means what it sounds like. God chooses of his own free will to pour his love upon unlovable people. We've seen this before in Deuteronomy chapter 7, how the Lord set his love on Israel when it didn't deserve it. And the sweet reality is, is because there was nothing in them to deserve God's electing love, there's nothing that they can do to remove that electing love. And the same is true for you and for me, if you belong to Christ. You could spend sermon series after sermon series talking about God's election and God's choice from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Talk, passage after passage after passage alludes to it, either, rather implicitly or states it explicitly. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, We should always give thanks for you, brethren, beloved by God, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Peter writes his first letter to those who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Paul says in Ephesians 1, he chose us in him from before the foundation of the world. And this concept of God's elect and his chosen really culminates in, 
reaches its climax in Romans chapter 8. But the reality is this. There's nothing that Satan can do or say that's going to change God's elect and his choice. And to underscore this, the Lord asks a question. You see that question at the end of verse 2? Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? As I study a passage, one of the first things I do is I read it and I reread it and I reread it and reread it and reread it, trying to just get an understanding on the surface level of what's being said. And as I was doing that with this passage, this question kept hanging me up. It's a very interesting question. What is the Lord saying when he asks that question, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? I initially thought he's talking about Satan here. But he's not talking about Satan. He's asking this question to describe his actions toward those whom he saves. It describes the rescue operation God undergoes in bringing his chosen and elect to himself. It pictures... Something that's in the fire and getting ready to be consumed, and before it's consumed, somebody reaches in and grabs it out. Now, Zechariah is prophesying to God's people, so this would resonate with Israel in two ways. On the one hand, it would be a very clear picture and reminder of what Brother John has talked about this morning, and that's the Exodus. God bringing his people out of Egypt. He he says in Deuteronomy 4, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Israel. In fact, I encourage you, if you have the, the ability, if you've got the tools or apps to do different word studies, do a word study on this word plucked. And you'll you'll see just how many times it's used throughout the entire Old Testament to describe what God did in bringing his people out of Egypt. But more immediately, it describes God's deliverance of his people out of their captivity. In judgment, God sent these people into Babylonian exile. But in mercy, he planted it into Cyrus's heart to let his people return back to their land. Bringing them out of the refining furnace of exile back to their homeland. And this question should resonate with you. It should resonate with me as believers because our salvation was a rescue operation. I mean, we learned that not too long ago from Colossians chapter 1. While we were trapped in the domain of darkness, God rescued us. When we were destined for the eternal fire, God saved us. Jesus himself said in Mark 10, 45, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And that ransom is a price that's paid to set someone free. And so the bottom line question this morning in this passage is if such a high price was paid to set us free, how could the Lord ever let us go? He can't. He won't. In the words of Paul in Galatians, otherwise Christ died needlessly. So here we see Joshua standing before the Lord, representing his people, representing you, and really representing me. He's slandered in God's presence, but thankfully he's defended. But the Lord not only defends him, he takes this scene that's revealed to Zechariah another step. And he cleanses Joshua. And we see, again, the parallel between Joshua and the believer, not only in his confrontation, but in his cleansing. Look at verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Now when you read verse 3, it's very clear immediately. There's a problem. Something's not right here. Joshua is not in the right condition to be standing before the Lord. And Joshua is not just some random person. He's the high priest. 
which means the expectations for Joshua are even higher. As the high priest, Joshua was supposed to stand before the Lord with the clothes that are specified in Exodus chapter 28. The very dress of the high priest was to be symbolic of the holiness as that priest ministered in the presence of God. The priest was the mediator between God and the people, and the people and God. Obviously, the people are sinful. God is infinitely holy, but in mercy, God established this priesthood to allow sinful man to enter his, his presence. And he did that through the high priest. But according to Leviticus 22.3, if any priest ever approached the Lord while unclean, he was to be cut off. Completely undone. And listen, when you, when you read verse 3, and you read that Joshua is clothed with filthy, filthy garments... It's not just that Joshua has some dirt on his clothes. This is the same imagery that's used by Isaiah in Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous deeds are as a filthy garment. All of us wither like a leaf, our iniquities like the wind take us away. Now, garments get dirty. Clothes become filthy. But this imagery of filthy garments here and in Isaiah 64 are garments that are utterly disgusting and abhorrent to God. I don't know if you've ever studied that passage to see the exact type of filthy garments that Isaiah is talking about. But they're garments that are so soiled and stained. You can't clean them. They're good for nothing except to throw into the trash. And here Joshua is. He's clothed in these filthy garments. Joshua is in trouble, and he's stuck here, standing before the Lord, and there's nowhere for him to go. There's nothing he can do. He can't rid himself of these garments. And these garments obviously are symbolic for sin. The issue here is not dirty clothing. The issue here is sin. The issue is iniquity. Joshua, like every one of us, is a sinner in need of the Lord's forgiveness. This is why I say there's so many parallels between Joshua and the believer. We've all been here. If you're a believer here this morning, you've come to the point in your life where you've felt the weight and the seriousness of your sin. You've felt the filthiness as you've stood before the presence of God, exposed to His holiness, And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I wonder if you've ever realized yourself to be in this situation. Do you realize that before God you're clothed in the filth of sin? It's utterly abhorrent and repulsive to God. You can try to remove these garments and remove this filth with good deeds, But do you remember what Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, 6? Even your righteous deeds are like those filthy garments. I mean, you and I came into this world with these filthy garments. And as time goes by, as you live your life, these garments get filthier and filthier. And as Paul describes in Romans chapter 2, you're heaping up wrath upon wrath for the day of wrath and the revelation of God's righteous judgment. So what's the answer? What's the remedy for you here this morning? What's the remedy for me? What's the remedy for Joshua? Well, the answer is in verse 4. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Wouldn't you love to hear that this morning if you're here and you're not a Christian? Remove the filthy garments from him. This is the only hope for Joshua, and it's God's grace. God must be the one who removes the filthy garments, and he commands it to be so. And again, these filthy garments are an illustration of iniquity and sin. You notice he says there, remove the filthy garments from him, and again he said, see, I have taken your clothing away. No, no. 
I've, re- I've taken your iniquity away. That's what's being dealt with here. And you notice what he says. He says again that he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with festal robes. You see, it's not just the removal of the old filthy garments. There's this giving of new clothes. Joshua doesn't just need the removal of his iniquity. I mean, that would just put him on neutral ground with the Lord. No, he needs the positive credit of righteousness to be able to stand before the Lord. And it's the same with you, and it's the same with me. We don't just need our sins taken away. We don't just need to be forgiven. We need the imputation of righteousness if we're going to enter God's presence. And this is exactly what happened to you and happened to me at salvation because of the obedience of Christ. It's not just his death on the cross that atones for our sin, but it's his righteous life that's credited to us. Listen, making us as righteous as he is in the presence of God. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we're saved, we can say, like Isaiah 61.10 says, My soul exalts in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Again, if you're here and you're not a Christian, this should be a pretty serious warning to you. If you're not careful, you may find yourself like the man in the parable in Matthew 22. Turn over to Matthew 22 real quick, and let's look at that parable. If you're not clothed like Joshua is here, Jesus tells us a parable of what's going to happen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Jesus spoke to them a parable about the kingdom of heaven and how it's compared to a wedding feast. Verse 3, when the wedding feast is ready, the king sends out his slaves to call everyone who'd been invited to the wedding feast. But you notice at the end of verse 3, they were unwilling to come. They go out and they compel them. Verse 5, but they paid no attention and went on their way, one to his farm and another to his business. Some of the people who were sent out to invite them were even mistreated and killed, verse 6. So much so that verse 7, the king was enraged and sent armies out to destroy them and set their cities on fire. And then in verse 9, he sends them out again and says, Go out into the main highways and as many as you can find, invite them to the wedding feast. So much so at the end of verse 10 that the hall was filled with dinner guests. But look at verse 11. When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he noticed that there was a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? You know, I hope that if you're here listening to me, you're not asked this question on that day. You see the response of the man? He was speechless. Caught off guard. Thought he was invited. He was there. The king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot. Throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There's that word chosen. This is what happens with Joshua. He's reclothed, made righteous. But it's interesting if you go back to Zechariah chapter 3, Zechariah is watching this happen. And Zechariah sees something is missing. And so in verse 5, it says, Then I said, this is Zechariah, Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now, this is interesting. Here's Zechariah as he's watching this scene unfold before him. 
But he knows, even though Joshua has been given these new garments, he's not ready. And so he asks for a turban to be brought. You see, a turban was a key element in the priestly attire. And according to Exodus 28, 36, and 37, this turban that was given to the high priest would have a golden plate on it that said, Holy to the Lord. And for the high priest in particular, you know, all the priests wore their turbans, but for the high priest, there was also incorporated the, a, a crown. You could read about that in Exodus 29. And some believe that the reason why the high priest had a turban with the crown incorporated was that it was foreshadowing Christ, who would merge the two offices of priest and king. And just like the king... You know, when one king dies and passes on and a new king comes to the throne, it's almost like it's not official until they put on the crown. And it's the same with the high priest. Before the high priest entered into his ministry, he put the crown on. Put, he put the turban on that had this crown with it. And then he would immediately be anointed. You see, it's like that's when it became official. And so here... Joshua is made official after he's cleansed and put into ministry and priestly service. You see parallels there between Joshua and the believer? The Lord doesn't just save us from our iniquities, but the Lord enters us into priestly ministry and service to him. This is pointing to the priesthood of the believer. Peter says, we, we just sang that song, Tell of His Excellent Greatness. Peter said in 1 Peter 2.9, You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Revelation 1.5 says He loved us and released us from our sins by His blood, that's salvation, and has made us a kingdom, priests to His God and Father. So God does not just save us, He puts us into priestly service and ministry to Him to offer up sacrifices in the name of Christ. Through him, the writer of Hebrews says, let us continually offer up these sacrifices. Sacrifices of praise, the fruit of lips to give thanks to his name. You know, Paul says in Romans 12:1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. God not only saves you, but he puts you into priestly ministry. So again, here Joshua is representing the believer, confronted and accused by Satan, but he's cleansed. He's been given righteousness, put into priestly ministry. And then the third way he parallels the believer, not only in his confrontation and his cleansing, but in his commissioning. Verses 6 and 7. The angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house, and also have char charge over my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. Now in this commissioning, there are two demands that are given and then three rewards that are granted to Joshua. You see the two demands first. He demands that Joshua walk in my ways. This is a commissioning to a life of obedience. Joshua is to understand what the Lord requires of him, and then to walk in those ways. To live a life that conforms to what God demands. As I looked at this, I couldn't help but look back to the other Joshua, back in the book of Joshua, 
when he was commissioned. He was really given this same commission. You remember Joshua chapter 1, where the Lord said, Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right, to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall be on your heart and on your lips. It should not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate on it day and night. Why? So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will have success, and then you will make your way prosperous. This is the commission given to that Joshua. It's the commission given to this Joshua. It's the commission that's given to us. I mean, what is the great commission that the Lord gave us? Go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. I mean, this same commission given to Joshua to walk in his ways, that's given to us. I mean, if we're to make disciples and teach them to observe all that Christ commanded, that presupposes that we're doing that. We're walking in obedience. We're walking in his ways. And I love this second one. He says, not only if you will walk in my ways, but he says, if you'll perform my service. This is with regard to Joshua's priestly ministry. You know, Joshua was to function as the high priest. He was to make sure that only acceptable sacrifices were being offered up to the Lord. You remember the story of Nadab and Abihu. After they were executed for not following the Lord's requirements, Moses came to Aaron and said, this is what the Lord said. This is what the Lord talked about when he said, by those who come near to me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. That's the standard that the Lord is calling Joshua to. What I learned from this is that God demands faithful service from the priesthood. And you remember what we just looked at. We're a priesthood. God demands faithful ministry from us, the priesthood. That's why those verses I read earlier from 1 Peter chapter 2 and, and Paul and Romans chapter 12, he qualifies those sacrifices that we're to offer up to be acceptable sacrifices, to be well-received sacrifices, favorable sacrifices, sacrifices that are approved by God. This is what it means when we are to perform his service and minister to the Lord faithfully, doing it according to what he's revealed to us in his word. You notice the structure of verse 7. There's these if, if, if then. It's an if-then thing. If, if you do this, then this will follow. So those, those two demands that were given, if, if you do these, these rewards and these blessings will accompany your obedience. And there's three things that accompany the obedience of Joshua. Three rewards. You know, when I was studying this, I was trying to think about how to, how to word this. And as I thought about the word reward, I started to think, I don't know if that's a good word to use. It's kind of, I don't know about you, but I, I don't feel right talking about rewards as if we're doing something for what we're going to get out of it. You know, you're, you're just working for the paycheck kind of thing. But as I looked closer at it, and I actually did a search for this word rewards, nobody used the word reward more often than the Lord Jesus did. And when Jesus talked about rewards, he did it with the intention to get his disciples more motivated, if you will, to faithful service to him. I mean, he often spoke of what the Father sees us doing, particularly in secret, and rewarding us for those things. I mean, some of his final words in Revelation twenty two twelve 12 are, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. Paul understood this. Go back and read 1 Corinthians 3. When he's talking about himself and Apollos, he says, One planted, another watered, but each one is going to receive his reward according to his own labor. Paul knew that one day he was going to stand before the Lord 
and all of his work was going to be revealed with fire. And he says in that chapter, the fire itself is going to test the quality of each man's work. And if any man's work on which he built remains, he will receive a reward. I mean, Paul said that at the end of his life, right? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. I mean, read 1 Corinthians 9, Philippians 3, how Paul strives for the prize. Even Moses understood this. I mean, Hebrews 11, the writer says that Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather rather than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin. And he considered the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Why? It says because he was looking to the reward. And look at these rewards that are given to Joshua. You'll govern my house. You'll have charge of my courts. And I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. This first one, govern my house, seems to be talking about a restoration of the priestly judgment and instruction. God had very high standards for the priesthood. They were to know God's word. So much so that if there were cases that happened among the people and it couldn't be decided, they were actually to bring that case to the priests, and the priests were to judge. And their verdict was so serious that if the people didn't listen to what the priest said, they were to be cut off, stoned. Malachi said the lips of the priest should preserve knowledge and men should seek instruction from his mouth. He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. This is a privilege given to Joshua. That second one, you'll have charge over my courts. This is a promise of the privilege of being able to guard the worship of God. I mean, the courts was where the worship took place. This is where the altars were, the bronze altar, the golden altar. And then I love this last one. I'll grant you free access among those who are standing here. I mean, these are really privileges that are given to the church as well. I mean, there's a sense in which all of us here are responsible for guarding the worship of God. The true worship of God is not something that happens within the confines of the courts of a temple anymore. But the true worship of God happens in the confines of the true temple, the church. And so we, like Joshua, are being granted this privilege of maintaining the purity and the sanctity of the worship of God. And that last one, I mean, if Joshua has been given free access, how much more have you as a believer been granted this free access? I mean, there's a reason why the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom as Christ hung on the cross. Do you know what that signifies? It it signifies this free access to God. Because of his death and his resurrection and his ascension, we have this free access So much so that the writer of Hebrews invites us to come boldly. To come with hearts that are sincere and have full assurance of faith as we draw near to God. Well, as Joshua is commissioned to obedience and priestly service, you and I are commissioned to the same obedience. What an amazing vision this is. It's a wonderful picture of the salvation, the life, and the ministry, and the commissioning of the believer. And as we close, let me just reiterate a couple points before we're done. You and I will often find ourselves confronted and accused. Accused and confronted by our enemies and by the enemy, Satan. And when we're threatened with these reminders, as we often will, of the filthy garments. I don't know about you, are you ever reminded of those filthy garments? And accused 
as if you still have those filthy garments on, you can rest assured that those garments are gone, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, completely removed. In Christ, we're new creations. Old things have passed away, all things are new. You know, there's times, I don't know about you, but you need to remind yourself of what Joshua is told here in the middle of verse 4. See, I have taken your iniquity away. Look, I've taken them away. We can rest in the work of our advocate. We can rest in the work of our intercessor. He's there before the throne interceding for his blood-bought people. He said in John 6, 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. And he accomplishes this by his ongoing intercessory work on your behalf and on my behalf. We can rest in his electing love. As sure and authoritative as that statement is in verse 2, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem Equally sure and authoritative is the fact that he has chosen us from the beginning for salvation. I mean, Peter says we're protected, right, by the power of God for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. But remember, he's not only chosen and saved us, but he's commissioned us. He's put us into priestly service and ministry. We've been given free access to the Father. We've been given the ability to worship in spirit and in truth. And so he calls us to walk in his ways, to perform his service. He calls us to priestly ministry, offering up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to him. Looking to the reward. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. He's chosen us, he's cleansed us, he's commissioned us to live lives of obedience and priestly service. And so let's strive together to serve him faithfully. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, all of the richness that we've looked at this morning. We thank you for saving us. We thank you that while we are accused by the enemy, the adversary, you're there defending us, that you've removed the filth of our sin, and that you've given us robes of righteousness, clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. And we thank you for commissioning us to priestly service. And so we pray, Lord, as we've done this morning, as we offer up sacrifices to you, that you would be well pleased and that your name would be honored in Christ's name. Amen.